All right, welcome to lesson two. In this video, we're going to talk about uh, actually how to read the Bible. And the, the last video was talking really about introducing the Bible. Uh, this is going to be a little more hands-on and practical. I hope uh, you're, if you're watching this before class that you'll come and we're actually going to work through some of these things together and, and do some examples and some discussion, which will, I think, be really helpful. So I'm going to try to give you some ideas and concepts in the video. Uh, we'll try to work on them together in class. Uh, I'm going to start off on page 30, um, let's see, 36 of your book. There's some introductory stuff here that you can read on your own. Uh, but on 36, I want to start talking about kind of a Bible study method. And so we're going to be at the part where it says, when you open your Bible, when you open your Bible. Uh, this is a pretty common um, method that we would call inductive Bible study. And I can explain in class a little more the difference between inductive and deductive. But inductive Bible study basically starts with uh, what, we, what we see and what we observe, and it moves to a conclusion. It starts with specific truths that we find in different verses, and we build what I would call a network of truth or a bigger picture truth from those. And so we're going to start on page 36, and it says, when you open your Bible, um, usually what you'll see is observation, interpretation, application. I add preparation um, just because I think it's important here. And so what that, what that is, is preparation. First, I ask, am I ready to hear from the Lord? Am I going in with the right mentality? And I'll let you read through that section a little bit. But we want to we come to God's sacred word as though it's his sacred word. We want to expect that he's going to speak to us. We want to be open to what he has to say. We don't want to come just, with, uh, just for head knowledge. I've known people who are uh, well-versed in the Bible, who have studied it, only to critique it and only to prove why it's wrong. Those people, when, when God weighs their life in the future, aren't going to have any, any excuse to be able to say, well, I didn't know your truth, or I was never told that, or I never heard that about you. They know the Bible, but they don't believe it as God's word. And so uh, we want to also go in knowing that the more we know, the Bible says the more we would be judged by. And I give you a few verses there on the next page about that. Uh, and so we want to go in uh, ready to actually uh, obey the word, ready to actually take it in, ready to shape our lives around it, ready to let it introduce us to who God really is and what he really says about us. In this lesson, I'm going to give you several questions or sets of questions, and it might be a little frustrating because you might go, well, which one is the set of questions I should be focused on? I'm going to give you kind of an easy, medium, and hard set of questions, and I want you to do the one that you think you can do. A lot of this lesson is a bite off and chew what you can and leave the rest for later because getting to know the Bible is a process. And so if you're still really new to it, you're going to be missing some stuff. For instance, uh, there's things in the Bible where you, you learn to f get a feel for and get the subtlety of, uh, but that takes time. Just like with a person. Think about a person that you know really, really well and you can tell just by the littlest change on their face or their body language or their tone. Um, you have so much history and experience with this person that you actually know what those things mean. Well, the Bible is similar, and so the Bible will, will do these kind of subtle forms of communication at times, and you're going to get used to the feel of those, and you're going to uh, also be getting to know its connection. So also think about a person who can make a single statement to you and you know the context of that statement is very meaningful. Um, I remember uh, somebody asking me a question one time as a pastor and I saw all their family around start to like squirm and get upset and I thought it was a pretty reasonable question uh, and they explained to me later that this person, um, this had been a long-standing debate in their family and what I didn't know was that this person was asking me in front of them in order to get me to weigh in maybe on their side um, and so I, I didn't know what was going on, right? Because I wasn't part of that history. Similar with the Bible, you'll know, oh, this statement or this, this thing in the Bible is connected to other things, and so it has a bigger significance, but that takes time. And so as we go through this, I want you to do what you can do, and I want you to answer the questions you think you can answer. You're going to swim a little bit in the deep end sometimes in the Bible, but that's what's good for you. There's stuff in the Bible that I still scratch my head about or go research or pray about or, or, or you know, grapple with my own life on. 
that's good. That means you're learning. That, that's a good part of the process. And so in this whole lesson, take what you can take and the rest will come later. So first we want to prepare ourselves, right? We want to come to the Bible ready to hear it on its terms and not just on our terms, wanting it to just ag uh, agree with us. If you've ever talked to somebody, and this drives me absolutely crazy, when people talk to me about sometimes some very controversial things and just assume that I agree and talk to me as though this is just a matter of, of fact and no, everyone would be crazy to even question them. And half the time I'm like, well, half the things you're saying are questionable. Um, don't do that. Don't be that person with the Bible. Just walk in, blunder into the Bible and be like, well, Bible, you, you know, you know this and you agree with me on this. And, and you're saying this, right, Bible? Okay, great, great talk. Bye. No, give the Bible the authority in your life to be able to speak to you what it needs to speak to you. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. So we're going to we're gonna uh, first prepare ourselves, and then we're going to do some observation here on page 38. We're actually going to go through a process together. Uh, if you come to class, we're going to take a passage. We're going to kind of put it through some of these matrices and, and see what comes out. But observation. Observation, we're asking who, what, where, when. We're asking fact questions, and we're not assuming we know the answer already or we have the interpretation already. So sometimes we come to the Bible, and some of you are more familiar with the Bible than others, and those of you, I would say this to, you maybe have heard the Bible says this, or the Bible means this, but does it really say that? Does it really mean that? For example, many times at weddings, we say that uh, the Bible says that a threefold strand is not easily broken, and that means that uh, a husband, a wife, and the Holy Spirit are, make a strong marriage. Well, it doesn't say that, and the context isn't about that, and it's actually part of a Hebrew literary device uh, to say, you know, two is better than one and three is better than two is kind of how it works. It's actually talking about just relationships in general and friendships in general. Could I take from that that, that um, a, a husband and wife who are centered around the Holy Spirit are going to have a more solid marriage? Yes, I can, I can imply that, infer that. But that's not what that says or what that means. And so we're, we're putting a, an interpretation on it. Well, what happens with things like that is then people go to enough weddings and they hear that enough times that they start to say, well, the Bible says that a husband and a wife and the Holy Spirit are, you know, are the threefold strand of a strong marriage. Well, it doesn't actually say that or actually uh, mean that. We could take that from there. We could get there, right? We want to be really careful saying the Bible says if the Bible doesn't say. And so we want to start off with fresh eyes. So if you've read the Bible a lot, every time you come to a passage, come with fresh eyes. What does it say to me fresh today? Not that it's changed, but you may have crowded in other ideas that aren't there. Okay. Uh, secondly, um, I would say, and this is a little more advanced, um, but there's a great book called Misreading Scripture Through Western Eyes. There are cultural things that you and I in America miss in the Bible. We might understand some of what's there, but we miss some of the things that are there because culturally it's written in a different culture than ours. That book is very uh, intriguing to me and helps point out some of those things that we might just be missing. Uh, all right, so we want to come to it on its terms. We want to come to it and say, well, what, is it, uh, what does it actually say? Who, what, when, where. These sub-questions there on page 38, you may or may not be able to answer. You may or may not know, um, you know, what was going on at the time or, um, you know, when did, where did this take place? What else in the Bible happened there? You may not know. That's okay. When you can answer them, answer them. If you want to get outside research, you can do that. I'll make a recommendation or two at the end of the, the lesson. Um, but we, we do our best with what we can find. But we're, at first, we're just asking those kind of fact-based questions, okay? Um, you can also look for things like genre. Different parts of the Bible are to be read differently. Poetry is to be read very differently from history or from theology. So you read the book of, of um, Romans differently than the book of Psalms. Psalms is very artsy, artistic. It's talking about human emotions and human relationships with God and human experience in, 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 uh, in, in a divine context. Romans is a much more theological book. It's, it's less uh, experiential in some ways, and so you can take more of a fine-toothed comb to Romans. What does this Greek word mean? Where does it connect with the rest of the Bible? How does this bear out over here? How does this part connect with that part? Um, you can do that more with Romans. 
with, uh, with poetry or wisdom literature, we might say. Proverbs, uh, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Don't do that. Uh, let the art express uh, something about God's nature and your relationship to him in a different way than th strict theology does. I hope that makes sense. Um, words, you can look for key words, grammar, even if you're not really into grammar. Um, what's going on in the sentence? Is it a very action-driving sentence? Is it, is it a, a questioning kind of sentence? You can get real basic with this if you need to. You don't need to know Greek and Hebrew to study the Bible. There are tools that can help. Uh, there are times where there's, uh, as I talked about with translation last time, there are times where what's built into the Greek or Hebrew idea there or word there is something we can't express simply in English. Uh, and so we need a little more English than, than, than is uh, right there in the text translation for us. Um, but you don't have to be a Hebrew and Greek scholar to study the Bible. Um, repetition is something repeated over and over. This is a common Bible thing in or in, in by way of emphasizing importance. Uh, look at the structure. Are ideas repeated? Is there comparison and contrast? References to other parts of the Bible you'll see sometimes. Mood. Mood is one that you it kind of takes time. Like I said, that subtlety thing. Um, over time, you'll start to you'll start to get the feel of the Bible to the point where you kind of get its its emotion. Uh, and you can make interpretation from that. For instance, Matthew 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount, and it does not say, Jesus very kindly and peaceably said this, but I would defy you to read Matthew 5 through 7 in some sort of angry, um, you know, zealous, passionate tone. It's very peaceful, yet very truthful, and I think that uh, you start to pick up on that tone in more and more places in the Bible as you get used to it, okay? Just like with a person, by the way. You know, there's people um, uh, who they just, the way they sound is, is grumpy and angry. But when you get to know them, maybe they're not grumpy and angry. It's just how they talk. Um, or maybe they are really loud and passionate, but uh, you may get the wrong impression about them. The Bible is similar. Um, we need to l really sit in it for a while before we start to get the, the tone and the feel uh, that's there. Here are four basic questions to ask of Scripture. So if you're like, yeah, basic, that's me right now in my life, great, no problem. Here's my four basic questions that I would recommend you look for when you read a passage. Uh, what does this say about God or imply about God, reveal about God? When I say say, it doesn't always just come right out and say, God is like this. Sometimes it does, and we're going to see some examples of that in the next lesson. But sometimes it imp you, you go, well... This is talking about this, and that must mean that God is like this. Or I see God acting this way, right? So sometimes it's a little more subtle, but what is this revealing to you about God? Uh, look for that first. That's the, that's, the, that's the main thing because everything else comes from that. Second question, what does this say about me or imply about me? What, is this, what would this mean for me, right? And what about my world? What about everybody else? And then fourth, how do those interact? What happens with when me and what, what is it showing about my reaction or interactions with God, about God's interactions with the world, about my interactions with the world, right? How do these interact? Okay, those are my those are my basic questions. Um, they're on page thirty nine, and then what we want to do when we start to interpret is we want to interpret with Christ at the center of His story. We're going to talk about this a little more in class. But the best place I can send you for this is uh, sometime uh, in the future. We'll do unfolding gospel. I do that in this one kind of, you know, one then the other, then the other, then the other. Uh, unfolding gospel really is, a lot of it is this right here. This is a very, very, very brief version of what we do in that class. And so um, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us in John 5 and Luke 24 there, that the whole Bible, including the Old Testament, ultimately points us to him. And so when we read it, we would be reading it incorrectly and missing the point if we remove Jesus uh, as the person it's mainly speaking about and put me as the person it's mainly speaking about. But if I leave Jesus there where he belongs as the person the Bible is mainly speaking about, I will find what it means for me. Okay, So oftentimes we go through the Bible and we kind of look through this lens. Because this story, this thing happened, this was said, this is put in the Bible, because that's there, I will respond this way, okay? Because, insert story, insert fact, insert whatever, insert statement, I insert application. For example, because Abraham believed God and was counted righteous, I should have more faith. Well, okay, um, 
perhaps, but what I would what I would encourage us to do is to look instead of just what does the Bible say and how do I how do I respond? I want to make sure we're not taking God out of the picture and specifically taking Jesus Christ out of the picture. And so a, a, a better a better way I think to read the Bible would be to say, uh, start with what what it says, right? Story or statement. Because why? Because God what? Put some theology in there. What is this saying about God, implying about God, revealing about God? What is this? How does this point me to Christ? How does it point me to God? Or how does it point me to Jesus as he reveals God to us, right? If God is that, then I what? Okay, what's my response? So my example now is Abraham believed God and was counted righteous because God is faithful and is glorified when we trust him. He is worthy to call us righteous. He is sacrificial enough to take our punishment on himself. Therefore, I am wholly righteous and will eagerly await all God's further promises. Now, you could have interpreted that Abraham thing. You could have a different uh, uh, sentence there. That's fine. That's not the point. What I want you to see there is that we get more out of it when we when we start with who is God, and we get more uh, for me when we when we um, when we go from God to me rather than just from the Bible to me. This is a little bit artful. This takes a little practice. Again, I really recommend taking Unfolding Gospel, but I wanted to make sure that you have it here uh, as well, at least to introduce you to it. So further on that in Christ Centered Bible Study here on page forty one, some questions that we could ask in order to get to what is this, how does this point me to Jesus, or one, does this passage show a need for Jesus? Let me give you an example. I can read about lots of Israelite kings in First and Second Kings and all of their hearts turning away to idols. And I can say, okay, um, the Israelite kings turned away to idols, therefore I will not turn to the idols in my life. Uh, good luck, uh, but what I would rather see maybe is um, the Israelites uh, turned to idols because God is patient and allowed multiple generations to move away from him because he knew that he would ultimately bring a king who would be faithful and obedient to God and not only lead the people to God, but would actually be God among his people. Therefore, I am in Jesus's kingdom as one of his subjects. As one of his subjects, I will uh, entrust myself to his care. I will look to him for provision. I will stand up for him and out of loyalty to my king. I will allow him to set the standards in my life. I will allow him to shape my life. I will allow him to put me on his mission rather than trying to put him on my mission. And I will look forward to ultimately when I'm in an actual kingdom with him, ruling and reigning with him forever. Uh, that's a lot more than just saying, I will get rid of the idols in my life. Why? Because we're asking better questions of the scripture. If you've ever tried to get to know somebody and you ask questions like, what's your name? What's your favorite color? What city do you live in? You can say that you met that person. You don't know much about that person. And that would be a bad time to walk away. What would be better to be to ask a lot more questions? Why is that your favorite color? How long have you lived in that city? What do you like about that city? Uh, what, other, what other places have you lived before? Where would you live if you could live anywhere in the world? Um, you know, uh, tell me about your name. What's the history of your name? Why'd your parents name you that name? What do you wish your name was? Uh, do you like your name? I'm asking more questions, and guess what? I'm going to get more information. Same with the Bible. Ask better questions of the Bible. You'll get more out of the Bible. But come and ask very limited questions. You're going to get very limited outcomes. You don't need to be a theologian to do that. I'm going to give you some questions in this lesson that are, are I think, more helpful to come to the Bible with than just what does it tell me to do. Um, but I really, I really want to encourage you that I can drop you on a desert island with a Bible and you can ask most of these questions and get a lot out of it. But I digress there. Second question you could ask to find Christ in the Bible is, does this passage show a problem Jesus suffered under? Could he identify with my, my difficulty, my pain, my victory, whatever it is? You see, we look to uh, biblical people to identify with them. There are going to be people in the Bible that you just resonate with. You feel like you get these people. They're your people uh, and others that you don't, you, you don't so much. But we look to them to identify with them, but they're dead. They can't identify back with you, but Jesus can. He experiences uh, experienced what you're experiencing. He experienced pain, loneliness, um, uh, being overwhelmed. He experienced, uh, you know, 
feeling like God was uh, far from him. He experienced fear, shame, our guilt. Uh, you know, he experienced physical pain. He experienced uh, betrayal, being lied about, being ridiculed, you name it, right? And uh, fruitlessness, uh, leading people who were not, um, didn't care about God, didn't care about what he had to say. He experienced all these things. And so sometimes it's not sometimes, it's, it's always helpful to look to him and say, uh, okay, if Jesus experienced this, that shapes the way that I'm going to go through it uh, when I'm going through it. Is Jesus redeeming or overcoming the fallen world? Here it's a little more technical. Um, but we might see Jesus' miracles and say, ah, he's giving me a glimpse of the way the world will be one day again. Maybe I will receive a miracle like this. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll see one. Maybe I won't. But I know that this is a glimpse of the way God is making the world to be one day again in the future when he makes all things right. Um, likewise, Jesus might be righting a wrong. So when Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days where he's tempted but remains faithful to the Lord, um, Israel had gone into the wilderness for 40 years and was tempted and did not remain faithful to the Lord. So Jesus is, is kind of embodying Israel and righting a wrong, taking the story in a new direction. Well, guess what? For me and you, the Bible tells us that Jesus' obedience makes us uh, counted righteous. And so his obedience not only rights a wrong from the past, uh, it also uh, rights a wrong in the future where I'm going to be disobedient but Jesus is obedient on my behalf, and if I put my faith in him, um, his obedience is transferred to me, so my disobedience is transferred to him. So is he making something uh, right here? Okay. Does this passage directly refer to Jesus in the Old Testament? Does it maybe just reference him or, uh, or something? Um, if you have questions on these, I can answer them. If you'd like to take Unfolding Gospel in the future, please do so. It is, uh, uh, it'll go through this much more thoroughly and slowly. Okay. On your next page, page 42, uh, I give you more questions, nine questions here. So these are a little more advanced than those, those four basic ones. What does it say about God, me, the world, and how we interact? It's a little more advanced, but all of, all of these but one, you could answer on that desert island, just you and the Bible. Okay. So we start with what does it say? And I mean literally just what does it say? Maybe just regurgitate what it says. Don't, uh, don't try to interpret it yet. What would the first readers have seen here? The people who heard this first in the ancient world, what would they have seen? How would this have st uh, struck them in their culture, in their mindset? That's the question that sometimes you need a little outside research on, a little historical research. Um, it's important, so I included it here, but it's okay if you're not able to answer that one all the time. Um, you know, you, can, you still have the eight others. Where does this fit into the Bible storyline? The more familiar you become with that, I gave you a little taste of it last time, but the more familiar you become, the more you're able to answer that question and realize that that's important. Was this before the law of Moses? Was it after, you know, during the law of Moses, before Jesus, after Jesus's life, in the church age that we still live in, like in the book of Acts? When does this take place? That's going to be important. Um, theology. Then we move on from just the text facts to theology, what it's saying about God. What is God doing? Maybe to or through his people. Sometimes God acts through Israel. Um, what does he show through Jesus? Uh, all those kinds of things. Okay, what's he doing? Maybe through the church, his, his apostles perhaps, or to people, right? How, what does that show about God? Or maybe this just tells me something straight, just here's something about God, right? What attributes and characteristics do you see displayed? We're going to talk about those attributes and characteristics next time. Um, but what are, what do you see God as, uh, uh, merciful here as righteous, as loving, as, uh, you know, just as powerful as all knowing, what, what do you see of God here? Is Jesus redefining or resolving something? We kind of went over that a little bit with the wilderness example or miracles. And then application. First, what does this say about my identity and status? So before you try to apply it in the sense of doing something or living this out, first ask how it applies to you, if it does, right? What does this say about me? Um, Romans 5.2 says uh, this grace in which you stand, meaning your standing is grace. So instead of me saying, oh, I stand in grace, how do I, how do I make sure I'm standing in grace today? Well, you don't make sure you're standing in grace. Jesus makes sure you're standing in grace. You knowing that you stand in grace then shapes the way you live, shapes your obedience because now that you've been uh, uh, forgiven much and given much grace, 
You want to lovingly obey the God who forgave you and not give him more he needs to forgive you of. It also shapes your freedom when you do mess up, that uh, it's not devastating and final. And it shapes the way that you're gracious towards others as well, because you've been given much grace and forgiveness and given a status in, in Jesus. You now are going to treat others accordingly. Uh, but if you just say, well, I'm, I, I have a standing in grace, how do I make sure that I stand in grace? That's not how grace works. Just an example, but what I'm getting at here, what's important here, is that first you want to ask, what does it say about me, about my relationship of God with God, about where I am and where I stand before I, I think of what I need to do. The next one says, how am I empowered and transformed by God in this? How is, how is God going to do a work in me that I can't do myself, right? If it's talking about grace, okay, well, how is God already changing me in his grace as opposed to me trying to change myself? And then how does this shape how I live? It may not just tell you live this way, do this, do that, do this, do that. It may not do that. It often doesn't. The Bible has far fewer rules than we think, far fewer than we expect, and far fewer than I think we would like. I, mean, I think we actually would like somebody to just tell us what to do all the time and, and lay it all out for us. Rather, this is going to shape how I live. If I understand this about God and myself and my world, that begins to shape how I live. I say shape because it's not always going to dictate. Sometimes it's going to imply. If God is a God of peace then I need to live peaceably with others. And so how do I do that? And how do I look to God to help me make peace with others? If God is a God of order and, and not chaos, how do I bring order to the chaotic situations in my life and the lives of those around me? Uh, that's responding to who God is rather than just saying, I'm going to do what the Bible told me. Um, those are a little bit of different things. So those nine questions, if those are workable for you, uh, those are helpful. Somebody asked me once about this, which is a good question. Andrew, this takes forever. Do you do this every time you do devotions? Actually, no. Um, I often am, am um, two, two, two things. Number one, over time, when you learn to ask better questions, you, you ask them more quickly and you don't need to uh, always, I guess, go, wait, what was that third question again? You just start to get used to it. Second thing is this is not a formula, it's a framework. So if you don't ask these exact questions every time, it's not the end of the world. And if you do ask them every time, it's not like you're going to get the exact perfect right answer out of it because, you know, 2,000 years of church history has led up to Andrew's perfect nine questions. No, that's not the case. I said, I said two things, but I'm going to add one more. Um, I often actually ask those four basic ones. What does it say about God, myself, uh, and my world? Uh, and sometimes I get more basic than that. Right now, I'm actually reading through the book of Luke uh, and, well, all the Gospels, but I'm on Luke and just going, what do I see about Jesus here? What's beautiful about Jesus here? Um, because in my personal life, I often um, over-intellectualize things, including God, and fail to enjoy and, and see the beauty in what God is doing and what he's given me. And so I kind of forced myself into a smaller set of questions. What is Jesus doing? What's beautiful about him here? Kind of what can I praise him for in this? Um, that's not all these questions. Does that mean that, you know, I don't think they're valuable? No, it just means I think over at different times in your life, you're going to need to have different focuses. Um, but these are, these are kind of my stab at a few different levels or options of ways you can look at a text. I hope that makes sense and I hope it helps. Okay, moving down, um, we'll go to application here, beginning on page 43. And I love this quote by a guy named Trevin Wax there at the bottom. He says, go to the Bible looking for God, find him, and application will follow. But go looking for application, and you may miss both. Meaning if we go and just say, well, Bible, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? I often erase God out of that picture because I'm just not looking for him. I had somebody uh, teach me a thing one time. They said, how many birds did you see today? I have no idea how many birds I saw today. Why? I wasn't looking for birds. But if I asked you tomorrow, hey, by the end of the day, tell me how many birds you saw. You're going to be looking all over. Where's the birds? I'm going to count. And I got to keep my count going. What I'm looking for is what I'm going to see. Same with the Bible. What I'm looking for is what I'm going to see. So I better look for something good. I better look for God. And it says that uh, if you find God, application will follow. Finding God in the Bible is like 
setting down the first domino and the rest will fall. If you find who God is, that's going to shape who you, uh, how you understand who you are, which is going to shape um, what you do. But if I just go looking for what I do, I'm going to miss who God is. If I miss who God is, I didn't really get a good understanding of what I need to do or why or how. Okay? So we want to go looking for God, even uh, especially as we're looking for application. All right? Uh, some little fill in the blanks here that may help with, you know, how would I frame application here on page 44? If this passage reveals that God blank, I should respond by blank. This passage uh, shows that God commands something, so what needs to change in my life? Make that real personal. I can do this part, and we'll ask God to do this part in my life. We're going to talk in a later lesson about how we participate in what God does. We're not completely passive, nor are we completely active, but we participate in what God is doing in our life. And so ask yourself, what in this passage can I do, and what do I need him to do through me? Um, if that's confusing to you, I would say wait until we get to our chapter on sanctification and salvation. If you still are very confused, we, you and I can talk after that. Okay. Uh, what about passages that don't seem to apply in my life? There's going to be many. And so read through that. Um, I think it's pretty explanatory. I'm not going to read it to you here. You can read through that. And then on page 46, I talk about a raft for learning the Bible. Why a raft? A raft in requires multiple pieces all put together. And so you should have more than one way of learning the Bible, okay? Uh, preaching is one, and that's, that's for most Christians, that's the only one or the most common one. So they'll go to church, uh, and if they're if maybe a little more, uh, they might listen to sermon podcasts. I have uh, like three different ones that I tend to listen to on a regular basis, and so you might find good preaching uh, and listen to that, but that's not the only way we learn the Bible. You want to you have other methods as well. Uh, factual study, like commentaries. Uh, if you're ready for something like that, what a commentary is is really what it sounds like. If you watch sports, um, I think of the Olympics, right? There's Olympic sports that we just... Um, we may not know much about, right? Maybe you know a lot about football or baseball, but then you're watching the Olympics, let's say, and like, you, you don't know how curling works. I don't know how curling works. Um, but you're watching, and which they never seem to explain, which bugs me, but let's say they did. That's commentary, right? Well, the Bible is very similar. They're gonna, the Bible, there, there are scholars who have done kind of a running commentary. Some are more, they read more like a sermon. They read more like, uh, how this changes our life and our thinking. Um, others are more fact-based. And I actually would tell you to lean towards the fact-based ones because uh, you can, I, th I actually believe, I really do believe people can read the Bible on their own. And uh, yes, there are people with the gift of teaching and we can help people understand what's there. Yes, 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 of course. But really, uh, sometimes um, I think some of the, the more um, devotional commentaries, uh, while helpful, you could you kind of could have got there on your own, perhaps. What you kind of can't do, and I'm saying kind of on both because I don't know wh where we're all at, but what's harder usually is the facts. Um, when when it talks about you know the uh, the Assyrians, and you're like, what's an Assyrian? It's not super spelled out in the Bible they would have understood in the Bible times what an Assyrian was, but you might need to look it up. Does that make sense? So I would try to uh, lean on commentaries that give you what you aren't going to get just on your own, okay? My biggest recommendation for you is the Bible Knowledge Commentary. It's two volumes. You have to spend a little bit of money, but it's not extra extraordinary money. Um, and if it's going to help you really learn the Bible, I recommend it. So the Bible Knowledge Commentary, uh, there's a New Testament and an Old Testament volume very readable, but also uh, explains a lot. And so those those are uh, great beginner commentaries if you want to invest in that. Uh, solo reading there, um, read on your own, which is what we've been talking about. And on that note, to kind of end that, uh, end that topic here, just start. Just start and be consistent and take in a little bit every day and uh, maybe write your thoughts down and you'll be amazed at what you start to see for some, it's the Bible is very overwhelming. For others, it's like, no, this I just see so much there. Uh, wherever you're at, doesn't really matter. Just just be consistent and keep reading some, um, and you you will be amazed over time at what your 
able to see more and more of. Okay, memorization I think is really important. We have kids, I said this in the intro video, we have kids memorize Bible verses, but we stop when we're adults. This is something that I've been really trying to do. It's a challenge actually. I find it really challenging to keep them in my head, but nevertheless, um, you know, to memorize and to know where that was at least. Oh, I know to go look that up, even if I know the chapter, right? Okay, I remember, what was my thing about humility? I don't know, but I know it's in Philippians 2, so let's go there and I'll see what it said. Um, but Bible memorization, that's why I include memory verses in this uh, course. Again, as I said in the introduction video, the best app I found is Fighter Verses, F-I-G-H-T-E-R Verses. Uh, you can put in your own verses. It has little games, little um, ways to memorize it, and so... Uh, definitely worth the three dollars or whatever it is. Devotional reading is books that are more spiritual books. Um, sometimes they're day by day, what we call devotionals, where every day for could be a month, it could be a whole year, it'll give you a little uh, passage of scripture to look at and then some thoughts and maybe some some questions for you. Um, there's also books that are more on a spiritual topic that you could you could pick up. Some are, are real easy to read, some are harder to read, but those are often uh, a, a really good idea. I want to I wanna tell you, though, on the, devo the daily devotional thing, don't become dependent on that. Don't become dependent on that. Learn to read the Bible for yourself. Don't just, don't just always take what somebody else said. Um, we want to we wanna learn to read the Bible on our own. Uh, as well. And so don't become 100% dependent on devotionals. Uh, get to a place where you're practicing opening just the, the raw, unfiltered Bible and reading it on your own. A uh, discussion with others in church could be in a community group, could be at CR, could be at our one of our classes, uh, could just be casually, could be over coffee, whatever, but discussing with others um, is, a, is a very good way to hear other perspectives. So I'm going to argue both things. Yes, devotionals are helpful. It gives you other perspective, but don't become dependent only on other people to, to feed you uh, perspective. Okay. Um, and then living according to the text. We actually learn the Bible by living the Bible. So we don't just get to know the Bible in our head and then try to live it out. Uh, actually, by living out what it says, we then understand what it's actually meaning. It's a pretty... Uh, interesting thing. Some methods you could use to read the Bible, journaling, um, write your thoughts or prayers on a passage, uh, books. Uh, one that's really interesting is called Search the Scriptures. It's a kind of a program to take you through the whole Bible in three years, and it's just going to ask you questions. No answers, no, no commentary. It just makes you, hey, look at this. What do you think about this? Uh, you'll learn a lot actually that way. Devotional books I already went over. Verse memorizations I already went over. Uh, Cross-referencing is looking at one part of the Bible and going, how does this connect to another part of the Bible? That might be completely overwhelming at first, but you'll be amazed as you go. You, oh, that reminds me of something I heard somewhere else. Maybe where was that? Maybe I Google, where does where the, you know, da, da, and you start to write in this part of your Bible, see this part, and over in this part, see that part. Uh, that's, that's one thing you can do. Hand copying is something I do. It's not everybody's cup of tea. But I actually like to write out Bible passages. It makes it very personal to me as though um, I'm writing it. This may be hard to explain. Um, I do it when before I teach a passage. I always write it out by hand. It's sort of like, okay, I'm responsible now for what I know and responsible to be able to share this with others. And it also makes me on a practical level slow down and read it very slowly and carefully. And I, I see more there when I force myself to read it very slowly by writing it out by hand. Um, I actually find it relaxing too, but uh, maybe that's just me. A quick overview, you might want to read the whole Bible in a year. You can buy a one-year Bible. You can go online and get a one-year Bible reading plan for free and just read your normal Bible according to that plan. But a quick overview is actually a very good idea if you can go through it really quickly because you'll get a good picture of it as a whole. That can be hard to do when you read little snippets for 25 years, okay? But, on the other hand, our last one there is you can read a chapter or a pericope, if you remember that phrase from last time. Pericope is where you have that section heading. It's kind of that natural uh, section or story. That's my best recommendation, by the way, for what I would read in a day is a pericope, a little section. If you're in the market for a Bible, buy one with those section headings because they're kind of a natural thought chunk there, and I, I think that's the best. You could read a paragraph a day, but a paragraph often isn't the whole picture, so... Um, 
could be a couple times a day. The idea is consistency. Keep in it, keep at it. Um, I want you to do some homework. So uh, we'll talk about this in class, but I want you to take one of these passages below or any of your choice, but these are my suggested ones. I want you to try to do one of a few things. You could try to put it into this framework we have, insert what's said here, because what? What about God? And if that about God, what then, how will I respond? Okay. Or you could take the four basic questions and ask those of that passage. What does it say about God, myself, my world, and how those interact? Or you could take the nine questions in that little arrow thing uh, and move from, you know, text to theology to application and do it that way. All right. So uh, you have your memory verse there. And uh, yeah.